um, tonight, tonight or maybe tomorrow, depending. Fantastic. And I think there was a request to turn on the chat for everyone feature. I think I did that. Okay, great. Okay, let me. Can we have a response to post 1155? Not right now. We're trying to teach a lecture. <laughs> I have to admit, uh, we were surprised by the deluge of Piazza questions. I, I really, really would encourage all of you, if you're feeling behind on the labs, to please come to the lab sessions. Um, I have a lot of sympathy for people who come to the lab sessions and still feel like it's a lot of work. I really view it as my responsibility as a professor to try and make sure you all learn the material. But folks, if you're taking a lab class and you don't come to the lab, like you are playing this, this game on hard mode and uh, it's harder for us to help you if you don't come. I, I, that's that's the, just how it works. I realize it sucks having the world be online. It sucks for me, it sucks for all of you. Um, it's not a good situation. Um, and and we're, all, we're all honestly having trouble, but um, please come, <laughs> please come if you're feeling behind because it's, we're limited in our ability to help you, I think, just answering a million questions on Piazza. It's, the TAs have put in a heroic amount of work trying to answer sort of hundreds and hundreds of questions in the last week on this lab coming from 200 students, but the, the class is not designed honestly for that. The class, it's a lab class. It's designed for you to be in the lab. That's kind of how the class is set up. So. Um, that's, that's where we are. Today, we are talking about home networking. So let me try and get, um, what is happening here? Somehow I'm having trouble manipulating my windows. This is, this is not great. Well, let me just share my screen. All right. Today, we are talking about home networking. So there's going to be an evolution here from sort of the earliest days into um, how things work today with something called a network address translator. And we kind of want you to understand this idea of network address translation. But to get there, let me write out these words. So apps day two, network address Translation, well, that's, that's a little big. Huh. I think like my L key, this is crazy. I think my L key is broken. This is what happens when you try to teach online. Nothing works. Okay, let's try this again. There we go. Okay, the L key works when you make the font size smaller. So this is what we are teaching today. And I'd like you to interrupt me with questions. You can just honestly speak or you can, uh, you can write in the chat. I'll look at the chat, but that's what we're trying to teach. So let us talk about the earliest days of home networking. It used to be very simple. You had a computer here. I think I actually have like a little computer icon. Let's see if we can bring it. I'll just draw a dumb little computer. This box will be a computer. Let's make it, I don't know, we'll make it red. If this is not big enough for anyone, let me know. Okay, so you had a computer and you wanted to put your computer on the internet. So you would plug your computer. I'll just, I'll write on here, computer. Okay, can people still read this text where it says computer? Let's hope so. Yes, okay, great. So you take your computer and your computer would be running, let's see, your computer would plug into, in the olden days, your computer would just plug into another computer. So we'll take this computer here. Oh, wow, I don't even know what that is. We'll take the computer and you'd plug it into some other computer and you plug them in directly using, you know, honestly, in the olden days, just a wire, a serial port. So you have the computer here just plugged into some other computer. That was the olden days. And then we built this global gigantic network. Um, so let's, in the olden days, there would just be a byte stream and that byte stream would be sent over the wire. It would be very, very simple. And then we built this mega network. 
Um, and so there used to be these companies called internet service providers, and they would let you connect to them over something called a pair of modems. So your computer would talk to something here, we'll make this look a little different, something called a modem. And the modem would talk over like a phone line to a modem on the other side. So there'd be an internet service provider. We'll write out their domain here. ISP, internet service provider. And they're here. And they have the modem. And that modem talks to your modem over like a telephone line. Do like that. And at the ISP, the modem is turned back into like basically IP and goes out over the internet. So if we drew where the layers were on this, um, my computer is speaking TCP. And on top of that, well, let's make this much smaller. TCP, and on top of that, it's speaking IP. And then some computer way over here, let's call this, you know, let's call this Google or something like that, is speaking. TCP over IP. And, you know, Google's probably speaking like Ethernet to its router or, you know, Ethernet within its local network. But my computer here, honestly, is just speaking TCP to IP. And it's um, sending the IP directly to the modem. There's not, there was no sort of link layer in between. It was crazy. It was the 80s. It was a, it was a crazy time. Lots of cocaine and sending IP directly to, to modems. And then on the other side, IP would come out why is this white? Oh, Jesus. There we go. On the other side, IP would come out and it would go to what? What speaks IP? A router, exactly. So I'll make this say router. Do, 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 do. Um, and then from there, it would go like to the whole internet. Do, 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 do. And eventually it would reach, you know, some other some other uh, person on the internet like Google or something like that. So the internet service providers portion of this is really just this part. This part is the internet service provider. All right, is this diagram clear to everyone? Anyone who needs this explained more? Okay, so this is what we would call a level, let's call this level one. Level one, home modem. And when I first got on the internet, this is literally what we had. Um, we had one computer, it was plugged into a modem. When you wanted to go online, this is what you would do. You would uh, you dial the modem to the ISP's modem. It would make those crazy sounds, doo doo, tsh, and then your computer would send internet datagrams directly into the modem. And on the other side, the other modem would decode those and send the internet datagrams to the router. And then the router would route them all over the internet and eventually they would reach Google. All right, I wanna make sure, is this absolutely clear to everyone how this works? Okay, I'll take that as a yes. So let's talk about what the, what the addresses look like. Nikhil says, why would we go through a modem to reach the router? That's a good question, Nikhil. The answer is that there was, there's no way, I mean, the ISP is like miles away. So, uh, yeah, so the modems would be connected over something like the telephone system. So it is a physical wire, but it's a really long physical wire. And to send information over long distances, you have to modulate it. You can't send what's called just baseband signals over long distances. Like ethernet will not go miles and miles and miles. So we have to modulate and that's, you know, just, it's a little more complicated, but so the modem would connect to your phone line and it would, it would literally make a telephone call. And then the ISP would have a phone line and that would plug into their modem. So that's why we need the modem here is really to, it's really to go a long distance. All right, I hope that answers that. So let's talk about what the TCP connection looks like between the computer and, you know, let's say Google. By the way, is there anyone else in this whole picture who speaks TCP? Does anyone else have to care about TCP. No, no one else cares about TCP. The router, yeah, I have this wrong here. The router only cares about IP. 
the router routes IP, but the router does not look inside the IP payload. It's only looking at uh, the IP headers. So the router here is really only speaking IP. All right, so let's talk about what the sockets look like. If I open uh, a web browser on my computer and my web browser is talking to Google, what are the addresses on my socket? How many addresses does a socket have? A socket is going to have two addresses, the local address and the remote address. And each socket, if we're talking about TCP or UDP, each socket has two parts, the IP address and the port number. So the socket here on this computer, it's funny, if I were doing this lecture live, I would be looking into your eyes. Here I'm very dependent. I'm just going to keep going until someone tells me to slow down because I can't, I can't see you. So please do put a message in the chat. So, so the socket here, let's make this, I don't know why this is so big. So the socket on this computer has a local address. And that's something like, you know, let's just call it something normal, like 18.241.0.5. That's the IP address of this computer. And it's going to have a port number, like, you know, something, it doesn't really matter what it is, 50,050, or yeah, 50,053. That's the local address. And then the peer address is going to be Google's actual IP address. So let's just get an address for www.google.com. Let's see, it could be, I'll just, I can put 172.217.0.36. That's, you know, one of the addresses for Google. And then what port is it going to be on Google that I'm going to be talking to? What's the peer address? The peer port. 80. Yeah, that's great. If it's normal HTTP, it's 80. Nowadays, it'll be, um, you know, 443, which is the encrypted port. But you can just say 80. Okay, great. So this is what the socket addresses look like. This is what the socket addresses look like on my computer. All right, what do they look like at Google? Wish I could see here. Let me, let me, let me try not to screw this up. Can you still see, can you still see the window? Let's hope that let's hope that works. Okay, so what yes. do the addresses look like at Google? They're really just going to be flipped. So the local address for Google is this one. And the peer address is mine. I think I missed a colon here. Oh, I see. No, it's just a really long port number. Okay, so here we have a pair of sockets, and those sockets are connected to each other. All right, let me ask one question. Let's say this computer wants to open a connection to another computer, also on port 80. Can it reuse its local port 53050? Or does it have to keep that port reserved? Um, okay, so this is so this is not the right answer. The right answer is that it, it can reuse it. And I want to show you exactly how that's possible. Because it's really important to know that let's say there's another computer out here, which we can call, I don't know, let's call it Facebook or something like that. Or I don't know, they're out of favor now. Who's a website? What's a good website? Everyone likes this website. Let's call them Red Cross. Okay, how can you argue with the Red Cross? I'm sure you can. Okay. So if we want to make a connection to the Red Cross, GeoCities, yeah, because they're gone. So we could open another connection here. And let's see, what's the Red Cross's IP address? So their, their local address is going to be like, I'm just going to, I'm going to write it like this, Red Cross IP like this, so we don't get them confused. So that's their address, Red Cross IP 80. So I'm going to be opening a connection here to Red Cross IP 80. So my local address can actually be the exact same. And then the Red Cross's peer address is going to be uh, 18.241.0.5.50.050. So here, there's no collision. It's, it's totally fine for, the, for my computer to have two sockets that have the exact same local address as long as the peer address is different. And in fact, Google can have many, many sockets with the same local address as long as their peer address is different. Google can keep on reusing port 80 as many times as they want, 
as long as they're always talking to a different peer address. And my computer can keep on reusing this local address, you know, port 53050 as many times as I want, as long as I'm talking to a different peer address, All right? So these port numbers do not have to be reserved. Uh, Leo says, would the ISP router be serving to the Red Cross in this picture? No, you know, th there's a whole internet between the ISP. I mean, I could, let me take this little cloud icon, which I have somewhere. Anyway, th there's a whole internet in between the ISP and Google. So that it's not like the Google is directly talking to the ISP router. There's like, you know, many routers in between. I'll just, I can, we can paste them here, but th there's a whole internet uh, in the way. And, you know, the, the Red Cross has their own, their own internet connection and they're somehow connected to You know, well, I'm not going to try and draw it. But anyway, the Red Cross is connected to the internet as well. So they're, it's not like they're directly connected to the ISP. Is that, is that clear? I, I don't want to lose anyone here. Ho hopefully that's clear. I'm going to take out all these, all these silly routers here because they're kind of clogging this up. But this, this wavy line here represents kind of the whole internet. OK, so it's, it's totally fine for my computer to reuse this local address as many times as it wants, as long as each socket is connected to a different peer address. And it's totally fine for Google to reuse this local address as many times as they want, as long as it's connected to a different peer address. So I'm going to, just so we don't get confused, I'm going to call this Google IP, just so you're not lost with all these numbers flying around. OK. So that was level one, that's the home modem. All right, is everyone clear on this? Or would anyone like me to say anything more about level one, the home modem? Alex Wu says, what's the point of having so many ports? Like why 65,000? You know, one reason is to allow many different applications to listen. So, you know, Google has their web server listening on port 80 and they have their DNS server listening on port 53 and they have their HTTPS server listening on port 443, and they might have their email server listening on port 25 or port 587. So pretty soon there starts to be a fair number of ports uh, in use because an application that's listening, you know, port 80 can only be used by this web server. It can be connected to many, many different computers over the internet, but it's still, it still can only be one application on their side. So that's, that's one of the reasons. The other reason is that if I wanted to have many sockets all to Google, those sockets would have to have different IP address, uh, different local port numbers. So if I was trying to, you know, if I want to, if my computer wants another socket connected to Google IP port 80, it would need to have a different local address because I can't reuse the same local address to talk to the same peer address. Okay, great. So let us, uh, let's graduate one level here and we'll change from level one home modem and let's go to level two, a cable modem. So this is when the modems got really fast. No longer could you just connect a wire between the modem and the computer. Instead, I'm going to take off the red cross here just to make this a little less confusing. Uh, Samaksha asks, is each tab on Chrome a new port? Well, no. Honestly, Samaksha, every time Chrome opens a new HTTP connection, uh, it will open a new socket. And it's gonna, Chrome opens many HTTP connections. Every image it downloads could be coming from a different server. And, every, and so every image could result in a different HTTP connection, which means a different TCP connection. So just a single tab could result in many sockets. And you know, if those sockets are connected to different computers, uh, they could all have the same local port. Like if there's a web page that has an image from Google and an image from the Red Cross, those could all use the same local port as long as they're connected to different peers. But if there's a socket that has you know, two different images from Google and Chrome wants to open two different connections to Google at the same time, then it would need two different local ports. Dong says, is having many sockets open to Google better than having one big socket to Google? You know, Dong Zee, it, it depends. And this is part of our unit on congestion control, why it depends. Uh, sometimes having multiple connections is actually better. So I have to speed up here because we're trying to get through a whole lecture in an hour. So let's talk about level two, which is the cable modem. So the cable modem doesn't just connect directly with IP, there's actually a layer of ethernet here. So the computer talks ethernet to the modem and, this, and what happens here is just an ethernet network. And then the modem actually talks ethernet back to the computer. So there's a small ethernet network between the computer and the modem. And this results in a much faster connection uh, between the computer and the modem 
But what else does it allow? So everything else is the same here. The only difference is that instead of just a wire between the computer and the modem or between the computer and the router, there's an ethernet network. So what is the benefit of having an ethernet network instead of a single wire? Yeah, exactly. Multiple can computers can connect to the modem. Absolutely right. So let's move now to level three, which is local network. Let's just call this home, home network. Okay, so level we're on level three on the home network. So we got this ethernet modem, it's got an ethernet, but instead of connecting directly to it, we could actually connect. What is the thing that we connect to it um, that allows us to share the network, to have multiple, multiple local computers? What is that called an ethernet? An ethernet switch, exactly. So let's, let's bring in a switch here. All right. Don't say router switch. It's just, it's just a switch at this point because we just have a home ethernet. In fact, let me make this very clear. I'll say home ethernet. Okay. So we got the switch and then the switch can connect to my computer and then it can also connect to some other computer. Oh boy. Okay, here's some other computer. And the other computer will need a different ethernet address. It will have a different ethernet address because that's what comes from the ethernet, but it also need a different IP address. So maybe it's 18.241.0.6 and some other port number. Okay. So now we have a real home ethernet. Dominic says, how is this different from, from level two? Uh, is it that we're being explicit with the ability to add multiple machines. Yes, previously, Dominic, we just had a modem directly connected to a computer, but now we actually have a local network at our house. We have a modem connected to the switch and then the switch can be connected to lots of computers. So that's level three of home networking. Not, that's not layer, it's level. <laughs> oh yeah, I mixed up my words. So the level two is just the ethernet cable connection between one computer and a modem. And le yeah. level three, we're like, okay, now we can add a switch and make a home ethernet network. You got it, you got it. Awesome, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so now we have this home network here. And now look, we need two different IP addresses. All right, and we actually have, we also need, you know, these computers have different ethernet addresses. So what happens, first of all, how do these computers get these different IP addresses? There's probably some device here that belongs to the ISP that we could call like the DHCP server. Does the ISP assign the IP addresses? Yeah, we're about to add that. So there's a DHCP server here, and that's what assigns the IP addresses. All right. So this is now you have a home network. You have multiple computers. Each one is connected to Google. They have different IP addresses. In fact, they could even use the same port number if they wanted to. There's no reason not to. So this seems really great. This seems awesome, right? Does anyone have a problem with this setup? How many, how many ethernet addresses does this router have to keep track of? Are these private IP addresses? No, this is a real IP address. How many ethernet addresses does this router have to keep track of? If the router wants to send a packet to this computer, what is the ethernet destination for the router? Yeah, the, the router has to remember that if it wants to send to this computer, it has to remember, oh, the ethernet address for that computer is on, is on this link and the ethernet address for this computer is on this link and the ethernet address for some other router is on some different link. So the router actually has to remember all these different ethernet addresses. All right, let's graduate to another level here and we'll replace this switch. Uh, let's go wireless. Cause we're, you know, this is like the sort of 1999 is when Wi-Fi got real popular. So we'll change this to level four home wireless ethernet. And that's really long. So people just say Wi-Fi, home wireless ethernet. So instead of a switch here, we're going to replace this with what's called a Wi-Fi access point, an AP. Right. Do it like that. OK. So now there's a Wi-Fi access point here. And these lines, I guess, to show that they're wireless will make them kind of a little more gray. There we go. That's, that looks really cool. That's, that's all wireless. OK. 
So you might notice nothing has changed here other than the fact that the links between the access point and each computer have gone wireless. But everything else is the same. The access point is basically just a switch. Are people still following what I'm, what I'm saying here? If I were looking to your eyes, would I see you nodding? Like, why is he going so slow? The only thing that changed here is we changed this from being a switch to being a wireless switch, but nothing else changed. It's still just ethernet. And so this router here at the ISP has to keep track of all these different, um, all these different computers. All right. What happens if the ISP doesn't want to have to keep track of all those different Ethernet addresses? Let's say the wife, the router has, you know, a thousand customers, and each customer has like fifty devices in their home. You know, suddenly now the router has to remember fifty thousand Ethernet addresses. Um, that seems like a big pain in the neck. So what could the, what could the router do? What could the ISP do to manage that complexity? Yeah, Drew has it. Instead of letting me have this home. Ethernet that connects to the ISP's Ethernet, they could start. Well, yeah, they okay. They could flood every time. Nikhil, that's right. But a better thing would be to have a home network. So a home IP network. So this is even better. So here we have this Wi-Fi access point, but it doesn't connect directly to the modem. Instead, we have a different router in our house. And the router then connects to the modem. Do, 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 do. So we'll just move it down here because we're, we're running out of space. So the router has to speak IP. And then there's a wire going from the access point to the router, and then from the router to the modem, and then from the modem to the ISP. So now. The ISP doesn't have to remember all these different Ethernet addresses. Instead, the ISP just remembers that this port corresponds to, let's make this much smaller. The port corresponds to like 18.241.0.0 slash, let's say 24. So the ISP remembers, hey, this prefix, anything that matches 18.241.0, anything that matches the first three numbers, the first 24 bits, is going to go. Uh, out this port to this router. And then it's this router's job to send it to all these different computers. So suddenly now this router doesn't have to remember all the different computers. It just has to remember a, a part of the hierarchy. It just has to remember a part of the hierarchy. Is this clear how the, how the hierarchy helps? The ethernet addresses don't have any structure. It's basically just a random number that the machine comes with when it's manufactured. You know, this machine was manufactured by Lenovo. And so it has a number that you know Lenovo gave it. Every ethernet address has a random number. And so you can't really do routing here. You just have to remember all the different addresses. But if you assign a part of the hierarchy, like you know, these, the addresses in, in your home match the first three bytes of this, then it's much easier for the router because it just has to remember one thing. It just has to remember, OK, any address that falls into this pattern, into this category, is going to be sent on this port. So that's the benefit of moving from a home ethernet to a home IP network. Someone says, why, what's the difference between a modem and a router? Well, they do really different things. The modem takes in ethernet and spits out something that can go over a long distance, like over a fiber connection or a cable connection. But the modem doesn't know anything about IP or IP addresses. A router is thinking about IP and it's trying to decide what, based on this IP address, where should I send this IP datagram? So a router actually, knows about IP and it's trying to make the decision, where should I send this datagram? A modem is a much more mechanical thing that's just converting between the signals of ethernet and the signals of something that can go a really long distance. I hope that's clear. The, the router is the important part. The router is caring about IP. The modem is just sort of sending a long distance. Now, when you go to Best Buy and you buy these boxes, often all three of these things, the Wi-Fi access point, the router, and the modem, sometimes those are all one box that you get from Comcast. But they're, they're three different pieces of functionality, and you can actually buy them separately. OK, this is the home IP network. And this is great. If you have this, you are doing awesome. But what is the problem here from the I? And I should say, yeah, what is the problem here from the ISP's perspective? Why doesn't everyone have this paradise? All of these computers are just on the internet. They have their own IP addresses. It's OK for them to use the same port number. They're different. Why doesn't the world work this way?
So it's, yeah, it's sort of a trick question. The world actually does work this way if your I, ISP gives you IPv6. This is the world today, and it works quite nicely. Uh, if you have IPv6 and all the people you want to talk to have IPv6, this is wonderful. But in the world of today, not everyone you want to talk to has IPv6. And so as a result, the ISP doesn't have enough IP addresses to let you have an entire slash 24. You know, they're giving you 256 IP addresses. There's only 16 million of these slash 24 uh, prefixes. That, so that's not very many people that would have one. You know, the world has billions of people. So this is kind of not good enough. So now it starts to get fancy. What is a way that we could allow our home network to talk to Google without requiring a different IP address for these different computers? What is some added information, we've talked about this, that can distinguish different sockets even when they have the same IP address? For example, if this one computer wanted to open multiple sockets to Google, it could, it could do it. Yeah, exactly. It could do it if they had multiple port numbers. And so one way that you can allow multiple computers to share one IP address. So let's say the IP, the ISP is no longer willing to give us 18.244.0.1. It's only willing to give us like 18.244.0.17 slash 32. See how that's a single IP address? A slash 24 is 256 IP addresses, but a, you know, a slash 32 is just one IP address. So one way to do that is to have a single computer that acts as a proxy for all these other ones. So let's try and fit that in here. So let's go level five, let's level six, TCP proxy. Okay, so we, let's see, let's just try and move the modem and the router out of the way. What was the problem again with IPv6? IPv6 is great if both you have it and everyone you ever want to talk to has it. But unfortunately, a lot of companies don't support IPv6. Uh, and so you probably want to talk to some people who only have IPv4. So that, that's, that's the problem. OK, so let us put a new computer in here that we're going to call the TCP proxy. And this is, this is going to be really important. So. This computer is going to make all the TCP connections that we, that we care about. And so these computers are going to let's let's give them fake IP addresses. First let's give this computer a real IP address here. So this this well, it's going to have this IP address 18241.0.17. So let's give these computers fake IP addresses that no one is going to care about. So one way to do this is to start them with 10 start them with 10. That's a private IP address that's never part of the real internet. So you could call this one 10.0.0.0. You know, I'll just call it 90. And we'll call this 10.0.0. I don't know, 50. Um, and we're going to have them connect, not connect to Google, but let's have them connect to some address that belongs to the proxy, 10.0.0.1. And this one can connect to 10.0.0.1. And then they're going to connect to the proxy and they're going to write in their byte stream, they're going to say, hey, who, the person I really want to talk to is Google. So will you please make me a connection to Google? And any bytes that I print to the byte stream, I want you to write to your byte stream to Google. And any bytes you receive from Google, I want you to print back to your byte stream to me. So let's, let's go down to just one computer here because this is going to get confusing. OK, um, so there's going to be two sockets on this proxy. There's going to be the socket it uses to connect to the computer, and there's going to be the socket that it uses to connect to Google. So let's diagram the addresses for those two sockets. What does the socket look like that talks to the computer? It's really just the reverse of the socket the computer has. So the peer address is 10.0.0.1 port 80. Uh, the local address and the peer address is the address of this computer. Okay, so that's one side, one socket, but there's an application that reads from that socket and writes to a different socket. 
what is the local address of that other socket? Anyone want to volunteer? This, so the TCP proxy receives a connection from the computer on this socket, and the computer says, hey, would you please make a connection on my behalf to Google port 80? So what does that socket end up looking like? Yeah, exactly. 18.241.0.17. That's the real IP address that came from the router. And it could be any port, let's say 30,001. And then the peer address is what we're calling Google IP port 80. OK, so there's a pair of sockets connected by an application. And that application is called the, the proxy server. And you can actually do this. If you go into your Chrome settings or your Firefox settings, you can, you can configure a proxy server. Um, and that will make Chrome or Firefox always connect to that computer first and ask it to make connections on its behalf. So this is the simplest way. And this is how people did it. This is the simplest way to share uh, multiple IP addresses by instead having a proxy server. And anytime that a computer wants to make a connection on the internet, it just connects first to the proxy server and says, would you please make a connection on my behalf? All right, what is the problem with this? Someone says, why is the local address 18.241.0.17? Because that is the real internet address that was assigned by the ISP and by their DHCP server here. So once we have this, so we, we could have multiple computers here and they'd have different of these 10.0.0. addresses. So once we have this, those local addresses can be assigned by a DHCP server running on the proxy. So we have a second DHCP server here. Um, so the proxy has a second DHCP server that's assigning those fake local addresses. OK, is, Go is Google's peer supposed to be .17 instead of .5? Yes, it is. Let's change that. Thank you. All right, great. OK, so now we have two DHCP servers. There's the one that is run by the internet service provider, and that assigns this address. But it assigns it to the proxy. So this address here, 18.244.0.17, is assigned by the proxy to be the public address of this computer. And then the computer is also running a DHCP server, and that assigns these private addresses, like 10.0.0.90, to the computers uh, running in my house. And that could be my laptop. It could be my Nintendo. It could be all these different things. All right. So what is the problem with this? Why do we not run the world this way? This allows us to have as many computers as we want running in our, in our network, and they can all have different addresses. I mean, let me, let me show it just so it's clear. We could have a different computer here whose address is you know, .91, et cetera. And it's totally fine to have these multiple computers. They all make connections to the proxy. And then the proxy opens its own connection to, uh, to Google. And because the proxy has lots of port numbers, the proxy can open lots and lots of connections, even though it only has one IP address. All right. And the proxy is speaking Ethernet, IP, and TCP. So what is wrong with this? The, the main reason we don't do this is just because it's annoying to tell all your people in your house that they have to configure this proxy. Imagine, think of all the devices in your house that want to use the internet. There's your television and your thermostat and your switch and your sister's switch and your uh, laptop and all these things. Having to configure them all in Firefox to use a proxy or in Chrome to use a proxy is really annoying. I, mean, I don't even know how to tell my thermostat to use a, a TCP proxy, honestly. I know how to do it in Firefox. It's very simple, but I don't know how to do it in every single device that I have, like a Nintendo Switch. I honestly don't know how you create a proxy. So let's move to level seven, which is called the transparent proxy. So the only thing we're going to change here is the behavior of this TCP proxy. And we're going to make it do the same thing as before, but not with the computers knowing about it. So the computers are going to think they're connecting 
not to 10.0.0.1 port 80, but they're actually going to think they're connecting to Google port 80. And Google, however, is still going to think it's connect getting a connection from this TCP proxy. So the local address here is going to be Google IP port 80. The TCP proxy is going to pretend to be Google. Is that clear what's happening? The TCP proxy is not really supposed to do this. It wasn't assigned Google's IP address, but it's going to pretend to be Google. And there's no one to stop it. There's no one to stop it because Google is not really on this network. So when the computer makes an outbound connection uh, to what it thinks is Google, the TCP proxy is going to perform the endpoint of that connection and say, yeah, I'm Google. Who, who's to say I'm not? And it's going gonna, it's gonna to have a socket just like this. And the application will read the bytes out of that connection and write those bytes into a different connection. And when it gets bytes back from Google, it'll write those bytes back here. And so this computer thinks it's talking to Google, but really it's talking to the, to the transparent proxy. All right, is this, is this clear to everyone how we made this switcheroo? Nothing changed from Google's perspective. Google still thinks it's talking to this TCP proxy box and it is. But what changed is that the computer no longer has to be configured explicitly to talk to the TCP proxy. The computer actually thinks it's talking to Google, but it isn't. The TCP proxy is, is pretending to be Google. It's standing in for Google. Arun says, how does a computer know it has to send all internet traffic to TCP proxy? Well, Arun, it, it doesn't know that. In the transparent proxy, the computer doesn't know it. In the old world, in level six, the TCP proxy, the user has to go in Chrome or in Firefox and explicitly configure a proxy server. And the way that, that Chrome knows it has to do that is that you went into the Chrome configuration or the Firefox configuration, you set that up. That's how the computer knew it. But in level seven, the transparent proxy, um, the computer doesn't know it. The computer thinks it's connecting to Google. Someone says, is this a man in the middle attack? Yeah, that's true. That's exactly true. The proxy acts as a middleman known by Google, but not the machines. Yeah, this is actually right. The, the proxy, because it is in the middle, it can pretend to be Google. All right. So is the TCP proxy here typically a physical machine or a setting in the router? It, it, it depends. So if you go to you know, Best Buy and you buy one of these home networking boxes, the access point, the proxy, and the proxy is not the end of the story, the router and the modem are all you know, in one thing. There may be four different programs running in that box, but they're all in one physical box that you get from you know, Linksys or Netgear or um, Asus or Apple, the Apple airport. It performs all four of these functions, but they are, well, I guess that many of these boxes don't perform the modem, but if you get it from Comcast, it performs all the modems. Okay, what is the problem with this system? Or what is a way that we could make this better? Is it necessary? Let me ask, what happens if a packet is lost between the TCP proxy and Google? Who has to retransmit that packet? Let's say the user sent something and it made it to the TCP proxy, but then a packet was lost, but sent from the TCP proxy to Google, it got lost. Who has to do that retransmission? Yeah, the proxy has to do it because there's a TCP connection between the proxy and Google. Um, and it, let's say that something is lost between the computer and the proxy, who has to retransmit it? Let's say that the proxy was sending it. The proxy again has to retransmit it. So we're putting a big job on this proxy because it actually has to, to read the byte stream and to read that byte stream, it has to reassemble the byte stream and to reassemble the byte stream, it needs all the bytes in order, which means the proxy has to send back acknowledgments. And if it doesn't get them, it has to time out the connection. And the proxy on its TCP sender has to wait for acknowledgments. And if it doesn't get them, it has to retransmit. That's a lot of work. I mean, that's what you folks have done, right? <laughs> that's a lot of work. So what if, let me ask, does this really have to happen? Well, who else is qualified to send out segments and retransmit them if they get lost? Does the proxy have to perform this job? And the answer is no. So let's go to level eight here, which is called network. Let's call this network address and port translation. 
this is really long. Um, how do I make this much smaller? Okay, well, this is lame. Uh, oh, I shouldn't use that term. It's, it's, it's bad. Anyway, uh, so level eight is network address and port translation, where instead of a TCP proxy, we have something that doesn't perfectly speak TCP. It, it only understands enough of TCP to understand the port numbers. And so instead of reading out of that byte stream and writing back into the byte stream, all it does is change the addresses. All it does is change the addresses and the port numbers according to this pair of sockets. So that is called a network address and port translator, a NAPT. And people usually short this, shorten this and they just say NAT, but it's basically, this is the official term, a NAPT. So this device does not reassemble the byte stream. It does not have a stream reassembler. It does not send out acknowledgments. It doesn't have a TCP receiver. It doesn't wait for acknowledgments. It doesn't have a TCP sender. All it does is receive a segment on this socket and translate it to be a sent segment on this socket and receive a segment on this socket and translate the addresses to go out on this socket. So instead of reassembling the byte stream, it really just looks at the port numbers and, and the addresses and changes the addresses and port numbers and sends it along. So if this computer sends a segment, it's gonna send that segment from 10.0.0.90 port 50030 to Google IP 80. The NAPT is gonna receive that segment and it's gonna rewrite the local address to become 18.244.0.17 uh, with some port number that is unique, a port number that is unique on the NAPT uh, for the peer address, Google IP 80. And when it receives a segment coming in from the peer, Google IP 80, destined to its own port 30001, it's going to say, hey, I remember that that corresponds to this socket. And I'm going to rewrite the local address to be, um, I'm going to rewrite the destination address to be 10.0.0.90.53050. And I'm just going to send it along. So what happens now if Google sends a segment that gets lost somewhere in the ISP's network? Or really, what happens if Google sends a segment that gets lost somewhere on the wireless network? Who is going to retransmit that segment? Yeah, Google retransmits the segment. Instead of, the, instead of this box retransmitting the segment, the TCP connection is between the computer, all the way between the computer and Google. That's one TCP connection. But we have this NAT or NAT in the middle just translating the IP addresses and port numbers. And it translates them similarly to how it would if there were actually two different TCP connections, just like on level seven, the TCP proxy. Or the, the transparent proxy, but it doesn't reassemble the byte stream and it doesn't send acknowledgments. All it does is rewrite the segments. All right, I want to pause here for some questions and then we can talk about some of the complexities. So one thing we could do here is show you what this second computer looks like. Um, there's a question here. So in the proxy, each port corresponds to a machine in the proxy's network. And the answer is no, Dominic. Um, it doesn't have to. We just have to make sure that these sockets are unique. And the socket has four parts. It has the local IP and the port and the, and the remote IP and the remote port. So just that four tuple has to be unique. We don't need a unique local IP address, a, a, a unique local port number for every connection. We just need a unique local address for every remote address. So just like in the olden days in level one, uh, it's perfectly fine for a computer to reuse the same port number as long as those sockets are talking to different remote IP addresses or different remote port numbers. The NAPT only needs a different, uh, it, it only needs a different local port number when it's trying to make multiple connections to the same remote IP address and the same remote port number. Okay, uh, let me read some more questions. Um, Nikhil says, can you explain again why the proxy was useful in the first place? I mean, the real reason the keel is in a world where IP addresses are precious, the internet service provider doesn't want to give many, many IP addresses to each customer because they don't have them. And so they only want to give one IP address to each customer. And so we need some sort of proxy to share the internet connection. One, one sort of proxy to hold on to that precious single IP address that the internet service provider gives you and then allow computers to make TCP connections that share, excuse me, share that single IP address. Leo says, so Google's peer address is really a placeholder address that is translatable by the ISP, by the NAT. Well, Google's peer address is 
a real internet address that was assigned by the ISP. So it's, it's an IP address that belongs to the ISP and is available for them to assign. And that's what Google sees as the peer address. And the box that really owns that IP address is the NAT. That's the box that actually controls 18.241.0.17. And all these other computers with these private addresses are effectively sharing this address, effectively sharing this 18.241.0.17. Dongxi says, if I want to send a raw datagram, do you mean an internet datagram, Dongxi, an IP datagram? Yeah, if you, if you send an internet datagram to Google, no, the network address and port translation doesn't work because there's no port numbers in the IP header. So the only way this sharing occurs is that we can distinguish different applications because they have a different TCP or UDP port number. That's exactly right, you got it. Uh, Neil says, how are the local addresses of the home network determined? Well, this DHCP server here running on the NAPT assigns these local addresses. And there's a guarantee that any address starting with 10 is gonna be available because those addresses are reserved for private use. They're not used on the internet. So there's three of these ranges. One is uh, 10.0.0.0 slash eight. So any address that matches that pattern, meaning it starts with a 10 is, is private. There's 192.168.0.0 slash 24. So any address whose first 16 bits matches 192.168 is available. And I forget the first one, the third one. Does anyone want to look up RFC 1918 and tell us what the third address is? But the point is that those addresses are configured in this DHCP server, the one running here inside your house. And it just assigns these addresses. But Sirha, what's the, what's the net mask? Okay, great. So someone tells us that the slash 12, really? Okay, I believe you. So apparently 172.16.0.0 slash 12. So these are the private, these are the private IP ranges. So when you set up your DHCP server, um, you can configure it uh, with whatever combination of private IP addresses you want. And any of these three ranges is totally available. Now it doesn't have to be a private range, but you know, the safest is to use a private range unless you own some other range. Uh, Russell says, can a NAT be connected to multiple NATs? Yes, Russell, you could definitely do this hierarchically. You can have multiple layers of NAT. Okay, so I wanna ask one more question, which is how does this mapping here, the, the NAT has to remember there's a mapping between this local socket and this, this socket. How does this mapping get established? when will the NAT create this relationship between this set of local addresses and this set of remote addresses? Because all four of these, I mean, there's really eight pieces of information here. There's the local IP and the local part, the remote IP and the remote part, and that's on the private side. And then there's the same set of information on the remote side. What establishes this thing, which we'll call a NAT rule or a NAT mapping? What, how would the NAT know to start that in the first place? I'm gonna put some text here and we'll call this, this is called a NAT rule or NAT mapping. And all of these pieces of information is important to it. How does the NAT know to create that mapping? Let me ask, let's say Google sends tries to initiate a connection, sends a, a TCP segment with the SYN bit set, sends it to 18.241.0.17 port, you know, port, uh, you know, 20,000. What will the NAT do right now if this is its table of rules and an incoming SYN comes in from Google to port 20,000? Can the NAT do anything? Nikhil says reject it. But what if, what if this computer here is running a server and it's very eager to receive an incoming connection? So that's just not possible because let's talk about how do these NAT rules get established? The simplest way they get established is when the NAT sees an outgoing SYN segment from the internal network to the external network, that's when it creates the mapping. When the NAT sees that there's a computer here trying to start an, a new connection from this local address to this remote address, uh, a new outbound connection, then it can create the mapping. But if it doesn't have the mapping uh, and a, a new connection comes in from the outside with a SYN segment set, the NAT has no idea which internal computer that is destined for. 
Is, that, is it clear what I'm trying to say? Why does the NAT know it when it's coming from inside the network, but it doesn't know it when it's coming from outside the network? What, what is different? The difference here is just look at the sockets. This local computer tells the NAT everything it needs to know. It tells the NAT, I'm trying to connect to Google's IP port 80. And so the NAT can translate that into its own IP address, the local address into its own IP address, but the peer address is port 80. So when it's an internal connection, the connection is being originated internally, all the information the NAT needs to know is there. But when it's an external connection, look at this socket, there's no way for the NAT to know what internal computer uh, it's destined for. The only peer address here is the peer address of the NAT with some port number, but that doesn't have any meaning. So only when the connection is originated internally can the NAT figure it out. Is that absolutely clear to everyone? I want you to tell me if this is not clear. And so the NAT mapping gets created when a computer inside the network tries to connect, tries to start a new TCP connection to a computer outside the network. That's how the NAT mapping gets created. When does the NAT mapping get deleted? Yeah, a lot of you are saying fin flag, but what do you really mean to say? Just because just a fin flag goes by, does that mean the connection's over? <laughs> Because a, a fin flag could be set. That doesn't mean it could be assembled, right? But yes, when the connection is over in both directions, when the four conditions that we list in our lab for the connection being over, when those occur, the NAT rule can be deleted. So that's how we create these NAT mappings. That's how we the NAT can delete the NAT mappings. And there's one more thing I want to say, which is that the NAT mapping can have a wild card in it. So it's possible to make the NAT mapping like this. And in this case, no other computer can connect to our local computer. Only Google IP port 80, when it sends something to 18.241.0.17 port 30,001. Let's actually, um, let's adjust this one over here so we're not confused. When Google sends a, this, um, a segment there, it gets translated into the, uh, into the, the real peer address, 10.0.0.90. But it's possible. Um, it's possible that this could have a wild card. So we could say instead that this would work for any peer. We could just say star. Um, so it's possible that NAT mapping could look like this. And so when the computer tries to connect outbound to any address, it gets translated into port 30001 and then goes out to whatever the peer was. And when any computer from outside tries to connect to port, uh, send a segment to port 30001, it gets translated back into the local port 53050. This would work just the same as before. The NAT mapping doesn't have to be specific to the peer. It could be general. It could work with any peer once it gets created. What would be different in this setting if the NAT mapping had these wildcards in it? What, what would be allowed now? Yeah, it would be possible for somebody else to send an incoming segment. And as long as they know the right port number, now they would know that it would reach the local computer. So depending on the behavior of the NAT, whether it makes addresses, whether it makes mappings that are as specific as possible or whether it has some wild cards, this can affect whether it's possible to make an inbound connection, even when a computer is behind a NAT. And so what I, what I really want you to know is there are different kinds of NATs and they make different kinds of rules. Sometimes the rule is very specific. That's called a restricted NAT. And sometimes the rule has these wild cards uh, and that can allow incoming connections. So uh, the second thing I want you to know is not to think of the NAT as a firewall. The NAT is not a security function. And the NAT does not necessarily prevent inbound connections from coming in. Because if the rule looks like this, it's totally possible for an inbound connection to come in as long as it's destined for port 30,001. But if the NAT is, if the NAT rule is specific like that, now it's not possible for an inbound connection to come in. 
because the connection could, you know, the, the segments could only come in from Google's uh, IP address port 80. So number one, there are different kinds of NATs and their behavior difference. Sometimes they put wildcards in these rules, sometimes they don't. And number two, don't think of a NAT as a security device. Don't think of it as a firewall because whether the NAT allows an incoming packet or not, whether it allows an incoming connection or not, depends on the details of what sort of mapping does it create. Okay, so over this lab, over this day, we've gone from level one, which is just the basic home network uh, over a modem, all the way to this level eight, where we have this device called a network address and port translator, really just called a NAT. And so typically that box in your house, the Linksys box in your house, or the Comcast box in your house, it performs all five of these functions. It's a Wi-Fi access point, it's a NAT, it's a DHCP server, it's a router, and it's a cable modem. But those five functions are really five separate things, at least in our, our modular way of thinking. All right, I hope I've enlightened you a little bit about how your home network works. Are there any sort of final questions? Looks like no. Okay, well, we have a lab session today for lab five. Uh, I hope you've seen lab five is out. Uh, I look forward to seeing you today, 6 p.m. Other than that, we're here for you. Have a great rest of the week. Thank you, Keith. Nikhil says, can you explain again why NATs can't accept incoming connections? So Nikhil, it, it depends. It depends on what the NAT mappings are, what the NAT rules are. But in the local case, let me, I'll share my screen again. Excuse me. If the NAT mapping looks like this, then only segments arriving from Google IP port 80 destined to this IP, 18.241.017, port 30001, only those incoming segments will be mapped to the, this set of addresses. And so if a different segment comes in from external destined to a different port number, the NAT has no idea what it should map it to. Whereas an internal connection has all of the information the NAT needs to know. An internal, an outbound connection from internal tells the NAT who's making the connection and who do they want to talk to. The outbound connection says, I want to talk to Google's IP address port 80. So the NAT has all the information to know who it should open a connection to. But when the connection comes in from outside, there's no way for it to tell because all these computers are sharing, uh, ultimately sharing the same IP address. So there's, there's not enough information for the NAT to tell who it should open a connection to. If you want to just look at the page, I'll, I'll leave it up. Maybe I'll... Kuda says, which of these functions are part of an internet gateway? Yeah, all five of them can be part of the internet gateway, Kudus. The Wi-Fi access point, the NAT, the DHCP server, the router, and the modem can all be part of the internet gateway. In fact, honestly, there's often also a DNS server in there. So there can be six functions in that internet gateway box. When would we want to decouple these five or six? Well, it depends kind of how professional you want to be. I mean, the box you buy for $100 is like, it's kind of a shitty access point. It's definitely a shitty NAT with like not a lot of memory for a lot of connections, kind of a shitty DHCP server with not a lot of configurability, might be a shitty DNS server. It's definitely a shitty router. It's probably a pretty good modem. <laughs> so it depends kind of how much capacity and how, how you know, sort of professional you want to be. It, it, and it depends how many computers you want to serve. If you just have a house with like, you know, 10 computers, uh, you know, including your thermostat and everything, you know, one of those $100 boxes from Best Buy is probably totally sufficient. Okay, great. Well, thank you all and see you in a few hours. Bye. Thank you.